Welcome back everyone to Kayla the Video Maker 2. This video is going to continue our discussion of primary keys inside of SQL Server. The first thing we are going to talk about is something known as composite keys. Then we'll go into indexes related to primary keys. But first, let's just start with the composite keys and get through that first. <laughs> now what is a composite key? A composite key is a key or a primary key that consists of multiple columns. So more than one column. It doesn't have to be two, it can actually be more than that. So you could have a primary key consisting of 10 columns if you wanted, <laughs> I think. I don't think there's a limit, but you guys can try and let me know if there is. <laughs> when would you wanna do this though? You would need to do this if one column is not enough to make an entire row unique. Let's go through a little example that shows this in action. We have a table. So we'll go with the bare minimum number of columns just to keep it simple, but you could have much more data in here if you really wanted to. But to start off, we'll name this class students. And over here we'll have the class ID and the student ID. Now for a specific class, let's say the class with the ID of seven, it has the student with the ID of 3,084. Could we use either of these columns to uniquely identify every single row? Well, as we have it now, no, we couldn't. That's because multiple students can take a class. So we could have seven and then 3,072. 3, now the class ID is repeating. So we couldn't use the class ID to uniquely identify each row. That's because there's repeating values. So if I said, oh, grab the one with the ID of seven, you wouldn't know which row to grab. So what about the student ID? Let's think about the same thing. Can a student take multiple classes? Yes. So that means we might have this student again, 3084, but this time taking a different class. Now we have repeating student IDs. So if I said, grab the row with the student ID of 3084, you wouldn't know which row to grab. So the student ID also will not qualify as the primary key. In this situation, a composite key is actually a really good thing we could use. Essentially, we're going to combine these two columns as the primary key. Now these are actually going to be foreign keys pointing to different tables. So we'll probably have a class table and a student table. And when we have two keys inside of a composite key, it's actually known as a compound key. But often people will use the terms composite, compound interchangeably. So don't worry about it too much, but I just thought I'd let you guys know that. If we made both of these IDs a composite key, the combination would have to be unique. So seven and 3084 could only be in there one time. So then I could tell you, hey, grab me the row with the class ID of seven and the student ID of 3084. And you would know it's always going to talk about this row. That's because we're not allowed to have repeating data. This would not work. Now you might also be asking, is it really necessary to use a composite key? Couldn't we just have another column right here and make it something like class students ID? And then every single row would have a new ID. So we'd have one, two, three. And then you wouldn't need to say two, you could just say one. Hmm, grab me the row with the class student ID of two. And you would know it's always talking about this row. Well, actually that does work. Some people actually prefer that. In this situation, you wouldn't be using a composite key. You would just be using a single primary key and it would work just fine. On the downside though, this introduces some problems because now we have to worry about repeating data, for example, seven and 3,084. So you might still have to make the combination unique. And if you're going to do that, you might as well just use it as the composite key for that table. But even so, some people still like to be able to refer to a row using only one primary key column, not a combination. So that decision's ultimately up to you. I'm going to try to go with this route using two columns, but if I need to, I will just go down to one column if, that, if I feel like that's relevant for the situation. <laughs> also keep in mind, you don't have to limit yourself to just two columns, you could have three columns. So for example, if the class ID and the student ID is not enough to keep each row unique, you can add a column. You could say semester, because you know, potentially a student could retake a class. That might not be the perfect example for this situation, <laughs> but you guys get the point. If you can't make 
the data unique using only one or two columns, add enough columns until it is unique. But you always want to get the minimum amount of columns. So if you can use two columns to make these unique, why would you add a third column to be part of the key when it's not needed? Always have the smallest key as necessary. Except for the situation which I discussed, we can use two keys here instead of one just because it makes more sense rather than having this extra column here. When you're looking at your tables, you might have to go through and look at all the different combinations of columns that could make a key. And these are going to be known as candidate keys. Then you have to go through this list of candidate keys and pick which one's going to be the most appropriate for your primary key. Sometimes it's not necessary to actually list all the candidate keys and you can just know, hey, this one's going to work as the primary key. But if you're working in a, an organization or in school, they might make you list the candidate keys and pick which one would be best for the primary key. Candidate keys also come up when you're talking about database normalization, which is a topic we're going to discuss in upcoming videos. But a lot of the normal forms of normalization talk about candidate keys and not just your individual primary key. You might also be able to guess if you're using natural keys, things can get a little bit more complicated because you don't just have individual IDs to identify rows. So you might have to combine a bunch of columns to make something unique, which can make normalization a bit more challenging, in my opinion. Let me know what you guys think if you prefer primary keys as surrogate or natural keys. Thanks for watching. Oh wait, ah, I gotta talk about indexes. When you make a column a primary key, that column is automatically indexed. Now an index allows your database to work with that data much faster. And there's two kinds of indexes, or two classifications, clustered and non-clustered. Now we'll discuss all the details of this in another video dedicated to indexes, but since this video is about primary keys, I thought it would be relevant to say that primary keys are automatically clustered indexes. And what that means is that the data in the table is actually organized by the primary key. Unique columns, these are actually automatically non-clustered which that's basically just lists all the data in order, but then makes a reference to that data. And as a side note, identity columns, those are not automatically indexed, unless obviously it's on a primary key, and that situation is going to be part of an index. But if you make another column the identity, it's not going to be indexed. Just thought I'd throw that out there if you guys were wondering, which you probably weren't. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's all I got to say about primary keys. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. If you like this video, please click like. Be sure to subscribe if you want to support this channel. And as always, stay chill. See you guys in the next video. Peace.